In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We go to Matthew chapter 12 now, and we're going to talk about the accusations that were being made against Jesus, his opponents who were trying to falsely accuse him. We see a lot of this going on in chapter 12. It really reminds us a lot of the prophet Jeremiah. If you study the book of Jeremiah, you see that Jeremiah's opponents were always looking for a reason, a pretext to accuse him falsely. And we see something similar with Jesus, our Lord. So we go into the chapter 12, and we're going to read just a little bit from the beginning of this chapter. And it says, at that time, Jesus went through the grain fields on the Sabbath. Notice it's the Sabbath day, the day of rest. His disciples were hungry and they began to pluck heads of grain to eat. But when the Pharisees saw it, they said to him, look, your disciples are doing what is not lawful to do on the Sabbath. He said to them, have you not read what David did when he was hungry? and those who were with him, how he entered the house of God and ate the bread of the presence, which it was not lawful for him to eat, nor for those who were with him, but only for the priest. Or have you not read in the law how on the Sabbath the priest in the temple profane the, profane the Sabbath and are guiltless? I tell you, something greater than the temple is here. If you had known what this means, I desire mercy, not sacrifice. You would not have condemned the guiltless, for the Son of Man is Lord on the Sabbath. So let's talk a little bit about the Sabbath, and first and foremost. So they're going through the grain fields. They're picking grain. Uh, in the Old Testament, Actually, in the book of Deuteronomy, you can see it here in my notes, in Deuteronomy 23, 25, it, it says that if you're walking through a person's grain fields, you have the right in any grain field to pick the grain and eat it if you're hungry. You just can't harvest the grain. So harvesting the grain would be different than just kind of picking it. So some scholars will argue that maybe this is an overly strict interpretation of the law because it was already legal to just pick some grain. You're not really harvesting it. So it's not, you, you know, should it be considered work because you're just satisfying your, your daily needs, you're hungry. Um, so many scholars would say that number one, the Pharisees are providing this overly strict interpretation of the Sabbath in order to condemn Jesus. But Jesus is not going to get into that. Look closely at what he does. Look at how he defends himself. First, he uses the example of David. David was fleeing from Saul, and he, with his, he was with his companions fleeing from Saul. They went to the city where the tabernacle was, and, and they asked for something to eat. There was nothing except the bread of the presence, and that was only eaten by priests. So they gave to David the legitimate king of Israel, and to his companions, the bread of the presence. And our Lord is, is going to point right to this example. And there's really something very important here. We call it typology. If this was okay with David, who was a king in Israel, how much more is it justifiable with Jesus, who's the king of kings? If David, who was the rightful king of Israel, fleeing for his life, could eat the bread of the presence with his companions, and this is only reserved for priests, how much more Jesus and his disciples on the Sabbath without violating the Sabbath. So look at what our Lord does. He, he points to this example in 1 Samuel 21 with David and his companions who ate the bread of the presence. So inside the holy place of the tabernacle, not the Holy of Holies, but just outside of the Holy of Holies, you had the menorah, the seven branch candlestick. You had an altar of incense, and you also had a table with the bread of the presence. Some call it the show bread, but it's really best translated the bread of the presence. And so here's a situation where David can eat the bread of the presence with his companions because they have hunger. And our Lord is essentially saying, how much more the Messiah? <laughs> 
And, and so what it is, it's an example of typology. If David was just simply a personification of the one who would come, a figure who personified one greater than him would come, well, how much more Jesus Christ who fulfills all that you know, was promised to David. David was promised an eternal kingdom. And here's Christ, the fulfillment of that promise. How much more could Jesus, our Lord, not violate the Sabbath if he and his disciples were eating grain, which already kind of was permissible in Deuteronomy 23, 25, not really considered work because they weren't harvesting the grain. They were just picking it to satisfy their hunger. So, any Israelite walking through a field could pick grain to satisfy their hunger. This was just a common thing. The Pharisees are trying to say, aha, you're, you're doing work. They're not harvesting the grain. They're just picking it to satisfy their hunger. There's a distinction made in Deuteronomy 23, 25. So one could say that they're at one sense applying an overly strict interpretation. But once again, Jesus doesn't get into that. The second example is the priests who serve in the temple. The priests who are serving in the temple, they serve on the Sabbath. They do work on the Sabbath, and they don't violate the Sabbath. Well, they violate it, but they're not held guilty. So Jesus uses the second example of the priest serving in the temple. It's very important. They're doing the service of God, and they're not violating the Sabbath. And how much more Jesus and his disciples, his disciples who are absolutely doing the service of God by accompanying our Lord Jesus how much more our Lord and his disciples. Uh, and so you see the example here. If you can understand that these are images of David and the priesthood and that Jesus is, is our true eternal high priest and that Jesus is the fulfillment of the promises made to David, you can look at this and say, well, obviously he doesn't violate the Sabbath. And so our Lord never explains it. He simply uses these examples. I've heard this gospel preached on many times, and I think a lot of times people don't get the point. They don't see this, this example of typology here. Okay, So if Jesus is the fulfillment of all the promises made to David, well, obviously he doesn't violate the Sabbath. So then look what our Lord says. He says, he says, that the Lord desires mercy. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. In other words, all the sacrifices you could make could not suffice for the mercy that I desire. Now, why would God use such an example uh, in the Old Testament and also in the New? So in the Old Testament, we find this example when Saul tried to essentially manipulate God. He was waiting for the prophet Samuel to come and offer a sacrifice. He was waiting, he was waiting, he was waiting. It was 1 Samuel chapter 15. And Samuel was late. And Saul wanted to offer a sacrifice to get God's favor. And so he offered the sacrifice. And after he offered the sacrifice, Samuel showed up and he said, big mistake, you should have waited. The, the sin that Saul committed was he was essentially trying to manipulate God through his sacrifice. And so we find this statement, um, and the word in Hebrew is chesed. It has a sense of loyalty and faithfulness. It can also mean mercy. So really in 1 Samuel 15, 22, it, it probably says something like, I, des I, I desire faithfulness or steadfast love, um, not sacrifice. And then we find the same statement in Hosea 6.6 6 as well. And Hosea talks about all the sins of the people of Israel, how they tried to manipulate God through their sacrifice, and then all, went out and worshiped false gods at the same time. Our Lord desired faithfulness, mercy, instead of sacrifice. So the word chesed, the Hebrew word, when it was translated hundreds of years before Jesus came, they they most often use the word for mercy. And that's why the New Testament often reads mercy. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. And if you really think about it, that's what we desire. We desire mercy. And you look at the miracles closely, you'll see people asking for mercy. And so the concept of mercy is so important. You know, sometimes people think they can just come back to church, win God's favor, and, and not make any real changes in their life. You're not going to be able to ma manipulate God. 
He wants a new heart. He wants a repentant heart. And so first and foremost, turn to the Lord asking for mercy. Turn away from your sins and then serve the Lord in faithfulness. Don't try to manipulate him with your sacrifices. Live a life of authentic fidelity in his presence. And so the next example that we have here in the readings, if you go to verse 9, it says, They went on from there and entered their synagogue, and behold, there was a man with a withered hand. And they asked him, once again, look at, they're trying to get Jesus. Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? So that they might accuse him. He said that he said to them, What man of you, if he has one sheep and it falls into a pit on the Sabbath, will not lay hold of it and lift it out? How oh, of how much more value is a man than a sheep? So it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. And then he said to the man, Stretch out your hand. And the man stretched it out. And it was restored whole like the other. But the Pharisees went out and took counsel against him how to destroy him. So look at what's going on here. Let's let's go back and look at a few things in the Old Testament. This is really interesting. There's actually a similar miracle if you go back to the book of 1 Kings chapter 13. The evil king Jeroboam he stretched out his hand, intending to take a man captive, and immediately his hand withered. Um, and so the unknown prophet in 1 Kings 13 um, he needed to intercede for Jeroboam. He had preached against Jeroboam, and Jeroboam got really angry with him and stretched out his hand towards this unknown prophet, and his hand withered because he was directly making himself an opponent with God. Do you see what's happening here? And Jesus's opponents are doing the exact same thing. So the story of a man with a withered hand, if they had really gone back to 1 Kings 13 and looked at it, they would have said, wow, Jeroboam was making himself an opponent with God. And they may have reconsidered their words and so um, in the case with Jeroboam in 1 Kings 13, 4, uh, the unknown prophet interceded for Jeroboam and his hand was destroyed. However, Jesus only needs to say the word. Notice the difference. He simply says the word and the miracle takes place. There's something important here. Jesus is the source of all cleanliness. Jesus is the source of all healing. He just has to say the word. He touches the unclean and they become clean. Do you see this? And we go to Jesus for healing and asking him to forgive us of our sins. And so look at what they're doing. They're trying to say that that is work. Your healing miracle is work. Well, wait, wait, wait. Let's go back and look at what the Sabbath is all about. The Sabbath, if you look at the very first Sabbath, everything was according to God's order. There was no imperfection. And Jesus is, what he's doing, every time he does a miracle, he's taking away these imperfections. He re, he's restoring everything back to how it was on the first Sabbath. So at one level, you can say that Jesus' opponents don't even understand what the Sabbath is all about. If you look closely at the Sabbath theology, you go to Genesis chapter 2, it talks about how the Sabbath is a day that is consecrated. It's made holy and it's blessed. And then if you go to Psalm 132, it underlines this concept of God's rest um, and it associates it with God's reign. And so really this is important to consider. A day that's set aside, it's holy, it's consecrated, it's blessed. And it's a day where God is manifesting his reign in the fullest way. And this is exactly what Jesus is doing. He's manifesting the reign of God. He's restoring this man. And they don't understand what the Sabbath is about. They have misunderstood what God's rest is about. To them, it's just command upon command. But they don't understand the meaning behind the commandments. And this is a very important thing to do.
especially in the church, we always try to study scripture and we want to know the meaning behind each miracle. We want to understand the meaning behind every practice we have in the faith. So if you ever if, read the catechism, you might try to read it regularly. The catechism is great at explaining the significance, the meaning, the purpose behind everything we do in the church. And so here's human, a man who's created in God's image. And Jesus is saying, you know, you're going to pull an animal out of a pit. How much more this man who's worth much more than an animal created in the very divine image. So now we're gonna, we go on a little bit. And we're going to read a little bit more from chapter 12. It says in verse 15, Jesus, aware of this, withdrew from there. So he was aware they wanted to destroy him. He withdrew and many followed him and he healed them all and ordered them to not make him known. This was to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah. Now, we already talked about the messianic secret a couple times. And so look at what Matthew does. Look at the prophecy he, he refers to. Verse 18, he's quoting Isaiah chapter 42. Behold my servant whom I have chosen, my beloved with whom my soul is well pleased. Notice, well pleased. You heard that at Jesus' baptism, by the way. It comes right from Isaiah 42. I will put my spirit upon him and he shall proclaim justice to the Gentiles. Well, justice can only happen if we have forgiveness. He will not wrangle or cry aloud nor will anyone hear his voice in the streets. Notice how he doesn't call attention to himself. So this is part of the messianic secret. He will not break a bruised reed or quench a smoldering wick. What does that mean? It's probably referring to the Davidic promise because in the Old Testament, I don't know if I have the verses here in Matthew's gospel, but I have them on other tapes. There's an image of the date of the Davidic covenant being like a lamp that will never go out. So he will not quench the smoldering wick of the Davidic covenant or break the bruised reed of the Davidic covenant till he brings justice to victory. And in his names, the Gentiles were, will hope. And so the, so the image of the Gentiles having hope, you can find that in Genesis chapter 49 verses 8 through 12 is a very special prophecy about a figure from judah who is likened to a lion in whom the nations will hope the gentiles will hope and so what i want to say about this section right here is this really gives us a little bit more information on what some call the messianic secret large numbers of people are coming to Jesus. And so Matthew goes right to Isaiah chapter 42, verses one through four, very special uh, scripture verse, Isaiah 42. I have uh, recordings on the book of Isaiah. You can find videos, a playlist on the book of Isaiah if you wanna go through those tapes and listen to them. There's four times where Isaiah talks about the servant of the Lord. Isaiah 42 is the first of the four servant songs. And so what's so interestingly is Matthew shows us that Jesus is the one who is the servant of the Lord. He doesn't call attention to himself. He doesn't make his voice heard in the streets. If you want to look up the uh, four servant songs in Isaiah, they're right here. I have highlighted them for you. So you can see them right over here uh, if you look at the screen. And so what's beautiful about this is it underlines Jesus's humility. It explains why he doesn't call attention to himself. And it also helps us to understand his cross because the moment that he does begin to reveal himself, he will be crucified. So this is something very important. So the Lord constantly says that he will not quench or, or extinguish David's lamp. Here's the scripture verses that you might want to look up. 1 Kings 11, 36, 1 Kings 15, 4, 2 Chronicles 21, 7, Psalm 132, 17. These are prophecies that God will not quench or extinguish David's lamp. And you're, you're probably going, well, what, what lamp are you talking about? <laughs> okay, it's a metaphor for what? 
for the promise that God made to David. He's not going to extinguish the dynasty that is the Davidic dynasty until the promise is fulfilled. And so essentially, this is an image of the promise. The bruised reed that will not be broken is also another image because the coming of a new king was associated with a new shoot coming forth from the stump of Jesse. Okay, new growth coming forth from that promise. And so the image of the bruised reed and the smoldering wick, these are metaphors of simply uh, uh, Matthew is underlining and Isaiah is underlining the promise that the Lord made to David will reach fulfillment. And so that's what's so beautiful about, about this section in Matthew's gospel. And so till he bring justice to victory. So obviously justice cannot be brought to victory until Jesus give his life for our salvation on the cross. And so it's so the concept of bringing justice to victory, it's referring to Jesus's paschal mystery, his suffering, his death, his resurrection, and his ascension to the Father. And also in his name, the Gentiles will hope. You find that in Isaiah 42, 4 in the Greek version, and you really find it in Genesis 49, verses 9 through 10, and also Isaiah 11, 10. You see it in many places in the Old Testament, to make a long story short. The Gentiles are going to hope in the Messiah. The great conversion of the Gentiles will come when the Messiah comes. And so at that moment, the Pharisees begin to ask for a sign. And we're going to pick up in our next video. We're going to have a part two for chapter 12 because chapter 12 is pretty long. So stay tuned for the next one. May God bless you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.